Over the course of history, artists and poets have often tried to depict abstract ideas into tangible forms. They ask the question, how might we describe or when we think about concepts like truth, justice, wisdom, freedom, what do we see? What do we hear? What do we feel? Actually, in Judaism, our sacred texts showcase this idea as well. In the book of Proverbs, we read descriptions of wisdom as a whole as described as a female figure. And this continues all the way up to today. Uh, I went to college at George Washington University in our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., and one of the notable features of the architecture that houses our halls of government is a statue way atop the dome of the Capitol building. It depicts a classical female figure with long flowing hair wearing a helmet with a crest composed of an eagle's head and feathers. She wears a classical dress secured with a brooch inscribed U.S. And over it is draped a heavy flowing toga-like robe fringed with fur. Her right hand rests upon the hilt of a sheathed sword wrapped in a scarf, and in her left, she holds a laurel wreath of victory in the shield of the United States with 13 stripes. The name of this figure atop the Capitol building is simply freedom. But apart from the image of freedom that adorns the home of our legislative branch, perhaps the most famous physical depiction of an abstract idea is typically a woman similarly draped in classical garb with a scale in one hand and a sword in another, her eyes typically covered by a blindfold. This image typically re represents the concept of justice, balancing the weight of evidence, ready to mete out punishment as evidenced by the sword, and with her eyes covered in a symbol of impartiality, you can also find her adorning the building, uh, the buildings of Washington, D.C., specifically beside the front steps of the Supreme Court. Justice is a hard thing to define, let alone enact in laws and statutes. As the blindfold on this female figure implies, much of our laws are meant to be general and impartial equal for anyone, no matter the circumstances or the particularities of the issue at hand. The law is blind, as it were, to certain specific elements about any particular case, and in this blindness strives for fairness. But there is a drawback to this approach because we live in a real world, not an abstract legal fantasy. Things happen, bad things happen. They are messy, they are defined by circumstance and by context. And in blinding justice, we often lose sight of those details of the person standing before it. General laws seemingly do not account for a person's name, their story, their background, and how they might be outside, how they themselves might be outside the norm or the default that was used to develop the system of law. As I mentioned previously, this week Jewish communities around the country are participating in the NCJW's National Council of Jewish Women's Repro Shabbat, an opportunity to highlight the current legal challenges to bodily autonomy and, for us as Jews, religious freedom brought with the overturning of Roe v. Wade in the summer of 2022 by the Supreme Court, and then the subsequent implementation of harsh abortion laws in many states. Now, the reason it falls on this Shabbat in particular is because we are in Parashat Mishpatim, the Torah portion simply named in English, laws in the book of Exodus. Of the many laws articulated in this section of the Torah, we find a case in chapter 21 discussing what happens in the case of an accidental miscarriage. The reparations paid to the wronged party 
which in ancient times would have likely been the father of the unborn child, are financial rather than corporeal. This means, for those who are not uh, up to date on legal lingo, I know that there, we have some attorneys here in the audience. You can feel free to correct me. This means that raj rather than issuing the typical punishment for murder or manslaughter, which in those times would have been death, financial compens compensation is indeed the punishment or the ruling. This, along with an assortment of other texts, lead our tradition to not only allow, but also at times require the ending of a pregnancy at times when the health of the mother is at risk, whether that be physical or psychological. This is grounded in the core Jewish value of pikuach nefesh, the safeguarding of human life. I don't want to delve too deeply into the details of these ru legal rulings tonight, and if you're curious, I encourage you to explore the NCJW's wealth of resources on the topic. What I do want to focus on is just as we see in the blinded justice, our Torah treats this as a hypothetical case. An example of, here's another legal term, casuistic law. That's again for the lawyers joining us. Um, where the woman described in Exodus does not have a name or a background or a story or a set of uh, parameters that guide how she ended up in this situation. She is simply a part of a theoretical exercise, likely concocted by men, that eventually has real implications in its implementation for real women and all folks who can bear children and with what happens with their bodies. So tonight, I want to take off the blindfold of justice and shed some light on the real stories of real people who are affected by these laws. Allie Phillips is a 28-year-old woman living with her husband and six-year-old daughter in Clarksville, Tennessee. Last year, she was 19 weeks pregnant when her doctor informed her that her unborn daughter had only developed two of the four chambers of her heart, one of the many issues that can arise during a pregnancy. The doctor presented her with two options, carry the pregnancy to term with a high chance of miscarriage, or seek to terminate the pregnancy, for which she would have to travel out of the state. The doctor could not offer anything more than that. Allie and her husband live a modest lifestyle, and flying out of the state with a few days' notice was not an easy task. Eventually, after fundraising with friends and family, they flew to New York and had the procedure. By the time they got there, the fetal heartbeat had already stopped and she was in danger of becoming septic, meaning her blood was becoming toxic. When asked about her experience by NPR, she said, quote, I'm very thankful for that clinic because they treated me like a human being, unlike my state did. She is now running for the Tennessee House uh, seat in District 75, in part to help change the draconian laws that endangered her health. Danny Rios is a 40-year-old woman living in Texas. In December of 2022, she was 20 weeks and three days pregnant when she learned that her water had broken early. The chances of the baby surviving were very low, but she could not terminate the pregnancy under Texas laws. Her family started calling clinics in New Mexico and booking flights for her and her husband but there was no appointment available for weeks. She developed an infection and went to the hospital shortly thereafter. Despite an allowance for her situation in Texas laws, all the providers had shut down, fearing prosecution or criminal charges. The doctors would not give her a C-section. Instead, she went through labor and delivery. And in her story, she writes, quote, it is so cruel to force a woman to give birth to her dead baby, to be awake and present, to endure the most traumatic way possible, the loss of her baby and hope and motherhood. It made an awful, senseless situation even worse. 
These are but two of countless stories of how the overturning of Roe v. Wade and the implementation of strict state abortion laws that followed impact so many people around our country. They are real people with names and stories and families and immense pain and trauma resulting from these experiences, not some legal hypothetical or fodder for campaign platforms. We must hear their stories. We must listen to them and to the millions who decry the attack on bodily autonomy now written in law. The reversal of Roe v. Wade not only affects these women, but has affected so many others who have not even been faced with the difficult decisions described in these stories. A recent study conducted by researchers at Johns Hopkins University wanted to see how women living in the 13 states with the strictest abortion laws, known as trigger law states, including our own state of Tennessee, were affected by the Supreme Court decision in June of 2022. For their study, they looked at women ages 18 to 45, and their study conclusively showed a significant increase in symptoms of depression and anxiety, much higher than those in the other 37 states. Another study calculated a 10% increase in the prevalence of mental distress among women who faced the possibility of losing abortion rights in the months following the Supreme Court's decision. The researchers also pointed out, interestingly, although perhaps unsurprisingly, that there was no significant difference in anxiety and depression symptoms in men in the same states or within the same time frame. Jennifer Payne, professor and vice chair of research in the University of Virginia's Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, wrote that what is clear so far is that abortion restrictions have significant public health impacts beyond the realm of women's reproduct reproductive health. This all might seem dark and hopeless and the reality of the situation around the country and here in Tennessee is indeed bleak. But it is not the end of the story. If we remove the blindfolds and we open our hearts to these stories, to the cries and rallies of women and all those who can bear children in our community, we can make real change in where we donate, in who we'd vote for, and in how we use our voices as citizens. A member of the Temple community recently commented to me that she felt like we were back fighting the same battles that were fought in the 1960s and 70s. She's right. But those battles were indeed won due to the advocacy and the leadership of organizations like the NCJW, with whom our congregation, as I mentioned earlier, has been involved with for decades. And finally, let me be very clear. This battle is not just for those whom these laws specifically target and affect, but it is a battle we must all fight, regardless of age, regardless of gender. As Jews and as human beings, we have an obligation to ensure that each person is treated with dignity and given the full scope of options when it comes to their health care. Tonight, as you may have noticed upon walking in, we've welcomed folks from a Step Ahead Foundation who does amazing work here in our community and, and educating young folks on their choices when it comes to sexual health. I invite you to learn about their work. I invite you to join in our Women's Health Advocacy Tribe, to support our local Planned Parenthood, and to continue to stay informed, signing up for their legislative updates on these important issues and specifically how they affect people here in Tennessee. There may be times when the eyes of justice should be covered, 
But there are also times when she and we must remove the blindfold and see the brokenness we so desperately seek to repair. Can ye hear ratzon? May it be God's will. Can ye hear ratzon? Nenu? May it also be our will. We say together, Amen. Shabbat Shalom.